Welcome to American Players Theater Talkbacks to Go. I'm Buzz Kemper, and I invite you to take a walk to the Touchstone Theater with Orrin Schroeder and me as Orange talks with actor Charles Pasternak and director James Bonin about APT's 2019 production of The Man of Destiny by George Bernard Shaw. We're going to be talking about The Man of Destiny by George Bernard Shaw today, and uh, I have James Bonin, the director, and Charles, who is playing Napoleon Bonaparte. And uh, this is an unusual situation because you're playing a real person, Charles, mm. and it's also your first time at APT. Mm -hmm. So uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and what it's like to play Napoleon. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm very excited to do my first season here. I've admired APT for a while and uh, been auditioning for a few years, and I was thrilled that I got to come in for this. Um, I've, I, I do a lot of theater, uh, a lot of Shakespeare, and um, but I've never professionally done Shaw before, so this is a, a, a new challenge and an exciting challenge. And, um, you know, I, it's, a, it's an early Shaw play, and I think Napoleon's a, a really fascinating, exciting part. Um, and uh, I think Shaw has a, has a sort of complicated relationship with him uh, in the play. I think he both sort of admires him and uh and uh and despises him in certain ways and uh and i i, I think in a way it, it it's reflective of of shaw himself and what he uh and how he felt about um the political aspects of napoleon and things that related to the british empire of his own time um so Playing Napoleon has been a fascinating process, and, and um, working with James and with Susan Sweeney, our text director, has been really exciting because the marriage of thought to character uh, has been a really complicated maze to navigate. Uh, Shaw's thoughts go on for so long, and there, there are times I find myself fighting just to make the thoughts clear, and suddenly you know, uh, the character disappears and there are times when I'm fighting for the character and, and the thoughts get muddled. So it's it's been a fascinating experience of marrying Shaw's complicated textual aspects. And um, I've, I've, I've found it really liberating and, and really difficult at times. <laughs> so that's been the process for, for me thus, thus far. Yeah. James, what do you want to say about Napoleon? <laughs> in, in this play? Well, uh, I think the, the most important thing for audiences to know, I mean, they, they'll know quickly, so I'm not giving anything away, is that it, it's not the Napoleon of the paintings that everyone knows or the you know, Napoleon of, the, of being made emperor in Notre Dame in 1804. It's, he's 26 years old, and he's just become a general. And so he's... And he's just become um, kind of legendary because of this battle that happened two days prior to when the play occurs. Legendary, at least he's beginning the legend, so that it is, on, in an odd way, um, I think very, very germane to the period we're living in now because of the the ways that people create a myth about themselves. I mean, in, in a sense, you're watching Napoleon struggle to see see how big he can be. Um, and we've chosen, via Jimmy DeVita's cleverness, to add some of Shaw's stage directions to the play. And so Jim Ridge, who plays uh, Giuseppe, you know, just a common Italian innkeeper, sort of acts as, like the stage manager does in our town at the beginning of the play, so that he's able to both establish the circumstance of Napoleon and at the same time comment quietly or ironically on Napoleon's journey, because like the stage manager in our town, he can mysteriously see into the future, even though he's, you know, a character in the play. Well, I should say, the character that Jim Ridge plays can't see into the future. Once the play, the actual play starts, Jim Ridge is just Giuseppe. But before, when he's introducing the play to us, he seems to have this kind of vision of the future. And at one point he stands behind Charles, who's, who's sitting, eating, and working, 
and he what does he say? He 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 doesn't know yet the the uh, fi- I'll find the quote. Mm. Ask Charles. Only only twenty six. Yeah. Well, well, just to talk, chat on mention yeah. this. I think what uh, Jimmy has done is is quite wonderful, and he's added some material um, or some fr- a framing device. But it also shocks me that Shaw wrote these brilliant stage directions. Just. I mean, really incredible. And most audiences never hear them. Um, and I think it's wonderful Shaw thought his actors could play them out uh, so well that they would translate. But it really is some uh, so, so beautifully written. I think it'll be really exciting, especially in this play, for the audience to hear some of them. Yeah, I because I think in a play like this that people don't know, mm-hmm. you can get away with bending it a little. Uh, whereas if you did it with one of his classic plays like Pygmalion, I, well, first of all, Pygmalion's almost twice as long as right. the Man of De- Man, of, Man of Destiny is very short. Uh, but just to just to finish that one thought, at one point, Jim Ridge is standing right behind Charles and says, "Only twenty six. Yes, he knows not yet what the world has in store for him, or what he has in store for the world." Mm. And it just has that kind of quiver of. Um, the way power works, which I think is one of Shaw's big obsessions in life, is mm. the way people take on power and responsibility and, and what they do with it once they get it. So are, is, um, is Jim DeVita being credited as adapting the no, play? No, he asked not to be. But he is... But it's, in he, my director's notes, I reveal, I let people know that he did it. Okay. Mm. Uh, and you mentioned Shaw's use of language. No one loves language more. And I think, Charles, you alluded to the fact that some of the speeches get rather long because mm. I think if there's one kind of language that Shaw loves, it's Shaw's own <laughs> language. <laughs> and uh, that must be a real challenge. But it's also one of the things that we love about his work. Um, yeah, it's a, I'd say it's a challenge, but I, don't, I mean, it's also a joy um, I love that this theater does Shaw, and I was sort of wonderfully surprised when somebody told me early. Well, I was surprised when I came in here that the show was selling out, um, and that my, when my family, my, my guests come, I'm fighting for some tickets now. <laughs> um, and they said, "Yeah, you know, audiences at APT, you know, just think of Shaw like you know they're sort of Neil Simon or whatever. They eat it up, they love it, and I think it's incredible that a theater has that. I think it's." Speaks very positively to this theater and to its audience that they have to, that, that they are that they can eat up language like that, and so it's a joy as an actor to get to come in and navigate these waters. As I said before, it's it, it can be very difficult and intimidating at times and infuriating, and sometimes you want to throw the script across the room <laughs> and curse his curse his name. But uh, but he you know, it it the, it pays dividends if when you work to go there, and I've been. I have a great part. I've been. I, I'm. I'm with a great team that are helping me get there, and it's a truly great writer. So, uh, it's a hard writer. You know, you sometimes you got to work at these things, and I don't know that many theaters want to do that. But I'm glad that this theater is, and this audience is is up for it. And James, you know, I don't know how many directors in this country have this many Shaws uh, to their credit. How many have you done? Oh, I don't know. Uh... Over a dozen. I think between Shakespeare, Shaw, and Stoppard, I've done over 50 plays by those three writers. There you go. Um, yeah, and I am sort of obsessed with the way all three of them write. But, it's, but Shaw's, uh, when I teach Shaw uh, workshops, I always say to the actors, if your thighs aren't aching when you finish a major <laughs> Shaw part, you're not leaning into the material enough. Because he just challenges you so profoundly. Because many times you'll have a speech that's seven or eight lines, seven or eight sentences long, complicated sentences, and they're really just one idea. Mm. And you have to find a way to not overemphasize, but yet hang on to something you might have said at the top of a paragraph (laughs) and then (laughs) sum it up neatly and tie a bow around it with the last four words, you know, 190 words later. And it's very, very difficult uh, in rehearsal the first week or two because the actors are just slogging through it and just Mm. feeling like... This is this this will just never work, and you just keep encouraging. And I always say to them, don't you know? These the first two weeks are just are as Jim Cartwright said in the play, "Road like walking through meat in high heels." You know, it's just <laughs> it's just 
complicated. Mm. But then it starts to be, as Charles intimated, a kind of a drug after a while. Mm. You just start to ride the mm. language. Yeah. And then it really gets fun because your muscles are growing and you can feel yourself just ready to rip through any idea. You know, and then everybody else seems insignificant as a writer after mm. you've <laughs> tackled these guys. You know, they're really... And August Wilson, frankly, is the same way. I mean, I think if there's a descendant of these other three, you know, uh, well, although Wilson has died before Stoppard, but, but I mean, they're, he's, he has that kind of magic ability to, to ask a lot of language, and yet it never feels outside of real life. Mm. I'm using air quotes there. Could you hear that? <laughs> real life. <laughs> they heard the wind of your air quotes on the, on the right. interview. And right. tell us about the, uh, the French woman who is involved in the... Uh, the witty war of words with Napoleon? Well, Shaw had uh, an extremely complicated relationship with women, <laughs> although he admired them, and, and many of his friends were, were, you know, part of the Fabian Society intellectual... I mean, all these women that he hung out with were tremendously bright and f completely committed politically. Um, and who argued with him all the time. I mean, Charles Shaw is a great arguer. I mean, he married a woman who was much closer to his mother's age than himself. He had this astonishing relationship with the actress Ellen Terry. I mean, their book of letters is one of the great book of love letters of all time, and they met exactly twice. Amazing. Yeah. I mean, so he, he he's... You know, and then there's lots of pictures of Shaw and Granville Barker wrestling naked, so you can make your own <laughs> assumptions about, you know, Shaw, like many people of his type, are very, very complicated on every level of life. But the woman in the play is uh, a friend... Uh, I sh no, I shouldn't give anything away. Uh, the woman is just is mysterious, and uh, she has something that she needs to get from Napoleon, and Napoleon has a strong need to have the same stuff. So I'm going to let Charles, I'll hand it over to Charles and let him talk about how he relates to the, as, as Napoleon relates to this woman, because she's wonderfully frustrating to him, I think. Yeah, you know, I, I, I think like um, some other Shaw heroines, you know, the man has just met his match. And I think it's exciting because... The play is Man of Destiny, and it is about Napoleon's discovery or, or perhaps embracing or choosing of the destiny that lies before him. And I think part of the play is the fact that he doesn't know if he's going to make that choice. And this incredible, formidable woman walks into his life out of nowhere, and they clash for an hour. And at the end of it, they have both discovered the next the next part of themselves, um, or the next, or the potential for themselves, they have they have re they have awakened each other's potential, and he is this great historical figure. I think it's exciting to see uh, discover the, his possibilities uh, through clashing with her. Yeah, and I think that's if, if that please, yeah, finished? please, yeah. yeah. I mean, I do think that's the the people who direct Shaw without understanding how much the strong heartbeat and the emotional heartbeat in the play, and who just get sort of, you know, dumbstruck by the intellectual qualities of the plays and the big ideas in the plays, are really missing something essential for him. I mean, he was a hugely passionate man and incredibly engaged in the world, and um, romantic is all out. And so this play is, is a deeply romantic play about two very passionate people who are struggling with each other about something essential, but through that struggle, as Charles said, you know, they're sort of, their hearts spring open to a whole nother mm. level. And it's a little bit like Beatrice and Benedict or something. I mean, mm. you, you sort of start rooting for them, no matter how, <laughs> that they, you sort of think, gee, these people are sort of suited to each other, you know? Mm. It's going to be a wonderful journey for us to take with you. Thank you both so much for coming today. Thank you. Thank you.
American Players Theatre Talk Backs to Go is a co-production of Orange Tree Imports and Audio for the Arts. Please find us on iTunes and YouTube under APT Talk Backs to Go. Our theme song is called Play in the Woods and is written and performed by myself, Ben Ferris, Tyler Willenbrink, Noah Gilfillan, Elliot Gilfillan, Grant Blaschka, and Susan Hofer. With Orrin Schroeder, I'm Buzz Kemper. Thank you for listening.